yelled. It was, it was really packed. Good. We it turned away 100 people. Did you really? Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. You had mm -hmm. to turn them away, aren't you? Well, it's kind of good, actually, because it makes good. them want to come back. I can remember my daughter in the theater, and she had a turn away crowd one time. And welcome very much to Conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program Mark Vicente. He's a co producer and director, cinematographer, major for two vehicles that have been in the public conscience for quite a while. The first was a, a film that got wide distribution called What the Bleep Do We Know, mm -hmm. having to do with quantum mechanics. And now they have a sequel to it called What Do We, or What, it, what Down the Rabbit Hole. So What, the, the, what the Bleep hole. Down the Rabbit Hole. You're right, What the Bleep <coughs> Down the Rabbit Hole. And it's a major thing. I happened to see a preview of it last night. Congratulations Thank on you. all of that. And welcome very much to Conversation Thank Manhattan you. Network. Thank you. New York City. New York City. You're based in Los Angeles. I think. I'm actually based in upstate New York now. Oh, really? Yeah, Where? I, I travel yeah. between, just north of Albany, I travel between Albany and, and L.A. Okay, I used to live upstate. Yeah, you it's did. really nice. It's cold yeah. up there. It is. It gets called a lot of snow. A lot of snow. Okay, I wonder if you could. We're going to be talking about the film and that sort of thing, quantum mechanics and the, the film, which is a major thing. But could you share a little of your, I understand you were born in uh, South Africa. I was. Well, could you share some of your <coughs> background, and then we'll get into the sure. film. Sure. Yeah, I was raised in South Africa. I was born in 1965 um, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when I was about six years old, I was motivated to want to figure out how to, to do some things in the world to alter it. Of course, I was very naive, but I decided, you know, I, I was going to figure it out. If you're not naive at six, there's something wrong <laughs> with you. <laughs> so when I was 13, I decided mm -hmm. that I, I discovered, you know, that movies may be a way to do that, and mm -hmm. I decided that I wanted to make films. Good. And so um, I traveled pretty extensively as a child. I lived in, uh, you know, South Africa, the U.S., Brazil, Portugal, Canada, and um, moved to Hollywood in 1992, left South Africa, moved to Hollywood, mm -hmm. and started working in Hollywood as a cinematographer. You're a grown person then. I'm trying to do the math. Well, 26 is vaguely grown. 26 is grown. Yeah, you're vaguely an adult. Grown, you know? yeah, but were you I still think I'm a child. Were you moving around as a youth with your family or something? I was. Your dad in the diplomatic corps or something? Uh, or? Mom was diplomatic corps uh -huh. and dad was in, in radio. I got great respect for the diplomatic corps. Yep, they yeah. work hard. Okay. So I moved around a lot. So in 1992, I came out to Hollywood mm -hmm. to... Um, start working on a picture and I just decided, you know, that was my lifelong dream to make movies mm -hmm. in Hollywood, you know, in L.A., so yeah. I decided to, to stay and never to go back to South Africa. Had you studied it all or did you pick it up? I had. I went to drama school oh, oh, um, okay. and I studied film in drama school. Uh -huh. And then while I was still, in, in actual fact, while I was still in high school, right. I started interning um, at television studios and all kinds of things. Where so was I, that? In South Africa. In South Africa? Johannesburg. I started interning at the uh, South African Broadcasting Corporation, okay, SABC. Interesting. Yeah. They had a British educational system there? I went to, there were a couple of different kinds. Yeah. I went to very British boarding schools. Yeah. Very proper. Public schools? They no, they were private. They don't have the public private uh, they confusion do. like in they England do. and then they Eaton, that kind they, of thing. They do, but I, I went to South Africa's version of, of Eaton. Oh, up, it was oh, okay. up in the middle of nowhere, and uh -huh. it was very proper and suit and tie all the time. Right, and university also? No. University was much looser. I went to a very progressive university. Where? In Johannesburg. And uh, studied? It's called Witts University. And studied? Drama and film. Drama? Were you thinking to act? No, no, no. Well, you Here's what happened. You were filmmaking. Then. I, I was indeed. Okay, good for you. Um, there, was, there was two film schools mm -hmm. at that time, and mm -hmm. one was in Pretoria, and I found it to be a very constricted, Calvinistic kind of environment. That's pretty constricted, it can so be. So yeah. I decided that I didn't want to do that. I'd mm -hmm. rather go to the other, which was, which was a drama and film school. Mm -hmm. In order to do that particular course, I had to enroll in drama school and do everything. Okay. So my first two years you know, were acting, singing, dancing, you, know, you name it, I did everything. Okay. And mm -hmm. then in my third and fourth years, I, start, I got to specialize. So uh -huh. I specialized in directing, cinematography, and theater lighting. Mm -hmm. so with film? With film or with well, the video? Well, directing film, uh -huh. cinematography film, and theater, theater lighting design. Okay, right. Uh -huh. And then started working in the industry there. Mm -hmm. You know, worked my way up through the, the uh, camera department. Mm -hmm. And then um, shot a film in 1991. I shot a film called Serafina with Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, right. Big star. Uh, big star. Yeah. And then after that... And what, you were a cinematographer? I was. Chief of cinema? I was the director of cinematography. Yeah. Okay, yeah. major job. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. And I was young. Uh -huh. I was 25 when I started the job. 25? You were young for that. Yeah, yeah. I was. Very young. Yeah. But I was driven. Yeah. I knew what I wanted. You? Oh, you were really driven in... Uh, okay, I understand. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And then Autodidact, you really picked it up on your own, sort of? And 
Oh, I, it was partially study and partially just working on films. Uh -huh. I worked in a lot of movies in the camera so department. So you would have been a cinematographer then, or is that fair to I say? I started junior? in the camera department as an assistant cameraman. Uh -huh. and then I, beca I, became, I was a second assistant cameraman, first assistant cameraman. Then I became a steady cam operator. Uh -huh. Then Wait, I became yeah. an, a, um, a lighting cameraman, uh -huh. and then a director of photography. Director of photography mm -hmm. is a... Because cinematography. cinematography is a real art form. Mm -hmm. is there, who's the greatest cinematographer in the history of the film industry? Is there somebody who stands out like we have actors, Chaplin, that sort of thing? There who is, is the, the most uh, famous is probably Vittorio Storaro, uh -huh. is probably the most famous. Somebody you learned from his example? You know, I read voraciously uh -huh. articles written by all these cinematographers right. and books written by all these cinematographers. Uh -huh. I was quite obsessed, you know, in my 20s with learning as much you. as I could. It's good to be obsessed in your 20s, I think, don't you? I'm still obsessed. Yeah, right. maybe for your whole life. But I'm still it, obsessed. Anyway, it's, it's an art form, mm -hmm. cinematography mm -hmm. and that, and it really counts for a lot. It, well, it's a lot of things. It's not just lighting. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's lighting, it's understanding the human face, it's right. understanding color and mood and contrast ratio, right. but it's also understanding how to move a camera, mm -hmm. how to provoke in people a certain feeling or a certain understanding as they watch something. So it's a very complex job. What you're doing is you're visually telling the story. Absolutely. Um, and that's what your job is. And yeah. you, you oversee a great many people in right. doing that. In league with the great photographers like uh, Kappa, that kind of stuff, the still photographers of the league, it's an art form as well. Yeah. And, and actually, we I studied into, photography yeah. as well. Uh -huh. And one of the things I did as a as in learning cinematography, mm -hmm. I studied painting as well. Really? I went to a lot of um, art museums okay. and spent, you know, hours just staring at paintings. Because what happens is, you know, at my, the, the, the way I can do it now, and I don't really shoot much anymore because mm -hmm. now I'm directing more, but you walk into a room and in your mind you're painting the room. Yeah. You're painting it, and then what you do is once you've painted it, it's almost like in your mind you track back to figure out where the lighting fixtures go. You know, and, and what the nature of that light is, and, yeah. and how soft it is, and how warm it is, and what the color temperature yeah. is, uh -huh. and how to control that light. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it's an amazing exercise in imagination. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Because I'm looking at a space, yeah. I walk into a space as that job, I would walk into a space and it's just, you know, lit with fluorescence or whatever. Yeah. And now I'm painting the whole picture in my head, mm -hmm. and then I'm downloading that information to people standing next to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, we want to do this, 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 this. And then two hours later, uh -huh. it's there. Yeah, you know, right. it's, it's an extraordinary experience. Yeah, it's important because the media is becoming the messy. I mean, it's because, because we've only had it available to us for a little while. We've had film available only. We didn't have it, you know, until just recently. Yeah, it's only a hundred years. Major. Very short. And short we could talk of time. for hours on it. And also, whether the transition from film to video is a big important thing, and the digital development now that's going on. But maybe we should. Maybe park that for a That's little while, one, but yeah. you had that background. Then you got into film. You got into you were in Hollywood, or you yeah. got into New York. Then, when I was finished with Serafina, I came out um, to LA to basically finish the film right. there, and then I started working in another, another film for Disney. Uh -huh. At which point, I'd waited for so long yes. to find an opportunity to come out here mm -hmm. and develop my craft further. So come I just out stayed here? to America. To America, yeah. okay, right. Because uh -huh. South Africa, you know, mm -hmm. the thing is, our film industry, we had a film industry, yeah. mm -hmm. but, you know, the dream of everybody who was in the film industry was to get to Hollywood because that's the center Hollywood. of filmmaking. Yeah, right. More than Bollywood or India. Yeah, I've never been there. So, okay, I mean, right. And I know they make a great many movies, yeah. but my dream was to make certain kinds of films. What kind? Big, huge blockbusters. Okay. You know, my my next film is a um, a science fiction thriller. Mm -hmm. You mean from the as you and I talk now, or the, or in your your the biography film that I am developing at the moment and about to start pre-production on. Okay. Is right. a, is a is a medium-sized budget, um, but it's a big science fiction story, mm -hmm. and has a lot of amazing science and amazing information in there, okay. but it's dressed in a science fiction story. Okay. Much like, for instance, The Matrix yeah, oh, wow. could be taken on the level of just a story right. or you know, a deep exploration of a, a type of mysticism or an exploration of what reality is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the next film I'm going to do has a similar format. Mm -hmm. You can experience it just as a, as a, a thriller mm -hmm. or as an examination of consciousness and, mm -hmm. and mind and science and who we are. I have a feeling you're kind of interested in that because your book, your film I watched last night had to do with consciousness and quantum mechanics right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. So you got an intellectual bent. Did you f study physics and all that sort of thing? Or no, I was actually miserable. I was miserable uh -huh. at, at mathematics uh -huh. and miserable at science until uh -huh. my last two years of high school uh -huh. when I discovered that I just had a phobia. A phobia. And I, I was just afraid. 
I, I had a certain a few a things that happened as a kid in relation to science and mathematics. Mm -hmm. I developed a phobia about it. So when I was in uh, my second last year of high school, mm -hmm. I had a, a, a math teacher mm -hmm. who reminded me of Inspector Clouseau. Oh. <laughs> and he was like, he was the funniest man I, I'd ever met in my life. Oh, and really? he made mathematics so much fun. Did he know he was funny? He was being funny? I think he or did. did think I think it was his character. Yeah. It was yeah. the way he did things. Yeah, and right, he made right. math so enjoyable. Oh, right. Good. That I just fell in love with, with mathematics. Really did. Head over heels? To the point that I got straight A's at that point. Uh -huh. did from you did? barely passing uh -huh. to straight A's. That's a lesson in there somewhere. Did you do the calculus or no? Funny, I never did calculus. You it was like never. It was no. We never did it. Like geometry or algebra. Right? Loved both. Both. Yeah. Okay, so you had a mathematical turn of things and everything. You everything turned around. It's and, a good then, and then science uh -huh. was the thing that I enjoyed science, but only when only later after I got out of school did mm -hmm. I start reading science voraciously. Mm -hmm. Voracious. And one of the first books. There's a I lot of it. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. The first book yeah. I ever read, actually, in that in that regard, was uh, Fred Allen Wolf's book, Parallel Universes. Parallel Universe, yeah. I read Michio that. Kaku has that one now, Parallel Worlds. It's really worth reading. Yeah, he's got Parallel Worlds theory, and yeah. Hyperspace, yeah. Hyperspace is I read great. Hyperspace, yeah. I read Hyperspace, is great. Um, and the Parallel Worlds is a good string theory, yeah. Yeah, string theory, I read, uh, yeah, I read Brian Greene's book as well. And uh -huh. he has a new one called Fabric of the Cosmos, I think. Yeah, yeah. Which I've not read yet. Uh huh. But that I read when I was about 19, uh -huh. and at that point, I just fell in love with it. And it and I also, as a child, had read a lot of Arthur C. Clarke and a lot yeah. of, um, the Sentinel. Sort of science fiction and fantasy. Yeah, wasn't it great? So when I started looking at the science, I thought, oh my God, this, this stuff is staggering. Yeah. It's completely amazing. I heard you last night at the uh, thing saying, you like to be in touch with people who are cross-disciplinary or mm -hmm. comprehensive or systems thinker, I think mm -hmm. I heard you say. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the systems thinkers that you latched onto? And who are some of the major systems thinkers who are sort of putting things together in a pattern way rather than specialization, which is the hallmark? Of most of academia, it seems to me. You who know, are some of the I haven't thinkers? actually. I've actually only met one person uh, who I think is a is a truly great systems thinker. But I would say to you that many of the scientists that we approached in making this films mm -hmm. are people that think in terms of systems. And Dean Radin is somebody who I definitely mm -hmm. is a, is a, think is a systems thinker. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, what I like about people like that is that they they understand that everything that they study is in relation to other things. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's what I love. And people like that yeah. are very, very brave and come up against the establishment sometimes who get very, very upset mm -hmm. at that kind of thinking. Because mm -hmm. everything is about focusing more narrowly into certain areas. Yeah, I went through academia and all that. And it was really it used to be grander than it did. It, it, it used to be, because I did geography. I was interested in everything. I, there's no department of everything at a university. Everything is broken down. And the specialization came really with an intensity where people would become highly specialized in a particular thing. Some people have told me they think that was uh, the work of uh, the British used to say divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bucky Fuller, who is my candidate for the best systems thinker of the history mm -hmm. of mankind and so forth, mm -hmm. as it happens, he used to say that it was a conscious effort on the part of the pirates what run the world mm -hmm. politically and mm -hmm. so forth. To, grad, to set up graduate school so they can get the best minds so specialized out mm -hmm. onto some particular thing, they'll never think about the whole right. and become a threat to the right. power that's being right. exercised by the pirates, which I thought was kind of funny. You know, it way. might be true. Yeah, I think it might be. It might be Oliver true. Oliver Stones, that's his favorite book. Yeah? Yeah, Critical Path. It's called, the, there's a name for it in the, uh, in, in the Secret Service. They call it um, Specialized compartment, Compartmentalized Information, SCI. Uh -huh, SCI. Where they have p scientists come in and they never give them the big picture. They just have, make sure they work in their certain area. And very few people have the big picture Yeah, very because they few. want to keep them focused. And then also, it's a way to keep um, security really tight. Well, this was getting the best minds coming up specialized out. Mm -hmm. So they would isolate themselves or stove piping or tunnel vision or mm -hmm. something. And they'll never think about the whole, some, you know, that kind of thing. So again, back to who were some of the, uh, Arthur Clarke thought on a pretty wide canvas. He and did. what you're doing is recognizing patterns rather than special case or, right. each, you know, that kind right. of thing. Well, that begins to get into quantum mechanics. Right. Peter Russell was somebody that I enjoyed reading as well. Theory. Peter Russell talked a lot about. Who? Peter Russell. He was a, a gentleman who talked a lot about, he wrote, um, he wrote a book called A White Hole in Time or A White Hole in Space, one of the uh -huh. two. And I remember reading that. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, my God, he's connecting all these things. Not saying that they're definitely connected, right. but he's drawing conclusions between all these things or, or lines of you know, ideas between these things that right. I found quite staggering. Yeah. Because uh -huh. that tends to be how I guess I, I think sometimes. I, I look at something over here and I think, I wonder how that's 
related to that. Me too. All the time is deductive, and it's one thing after another, and it's coming like a waterfall. Now oh, it's it one thing after another, and everything's related. Everything yeah. is related. The Vedic's been telling us for a long time, and that is a truism. That's part of, I think, the film you were saying, well, and was the theme that many of the people in your films, if I may, uh, came to. That it's really all a united whole system. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lovelock talks about Gaia. That Gaia, kind of the Gaia thing. hypothesis, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Organ, it's like an organism, the yeah. whole of consciousness or See, evolution of biological process on this planet. Here's the thing with with, uh, uh -huh. with some of the scientists right now that get upset at the right. content of the film is yeah. they, some of them say that, you know, quantum mechanics mm -hmm. is one thing. Unified and field theory is another. Those are the well, two big divisions. Even, yeah. even, even yeah. more different than that. Mm. That's one thing, and, and a human being is another thing. Mm -hmm. They're not related. Yeah, yeah. But the question I always ask myself then is, mm -hmm. a human being is composed of the subatomic world. Mm -hmm. So how can we say that, that the subatomic world has mm -hmm. nothing to do with a human being? Yeah. How can we say for sure that consciousness, mm -hmm. the, the experience of consciousness, mm -hmm. has nothing to do with this? Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason they say that sometimes is because at one point they did um, think that it was possible. One of the interpretations of quantum mechanics thought mm -hmm. that, yes, the observer did have something to do with that, mm -hmm. and then they kind of abandoned that, not because they conclusively found that it wasn't true, but because it was just damn inconvenient. Yeah, that's it. right. It was like, you know, what do you <laughs> right. So doesn't fit our mathematical put it formulas. There. Yeah. It and then, you know, yeah. people like, yeah. like uh, people who write these books, and then people like us who come along who are not scientists, yeah. and say, wait a minute, we think there's a connection. Yeah. The old guard gets really upset. Oh yeah, right. Because you're t you're trampling on their turf for that kind of thing, and people have a specialization. And then specialists are very interested in the particular details of everything. And when you're talking about being interested in everything, you're talking about pattern, mm -hmm. pattern recognition. A human conscience is particularly good at recognizing patterns. Or human mind. Fuller used to make a distinction between the brain and the mind, which is the way of being able to, you know, see the patterns that exist. You can see things whole and uh, a comprehensive kind of thing. I remember I was, I'd been in Bolivia doing doctoral dissertation with the Aymara Indian peoples in Bolivia for two years, and I came back in 1965 to an America that had been turned on its head. Yeah, everything, you know, Vietnam War and everything. In two days on public television, or two, within a week on public television, two people came on, Marshall McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller, and both of them had the same message to the, to the youth that was, you know, because everybody had their hair down to their backside. You had Vietnam, and Bobby Dylan was talking about blowing in the wind and all this change. And they said, dare to be, they were talking to academics or intellectuals, they said, dare to be a comprehensivist. And it's gone away from that now in academia, mm -hmm. it seems mm -hmm. to me. And again, so you, you, if I mean, who, who do you draw upon in terms of, the, I was really taken with you saying you like to be in touch with systems thinkers or comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the comprehensive uh, people that you draw upon, let's say just in your own educational development and so forth, that got you well, interested I never, in that project? I never actually or who are some of the polymath big mind? Isaac Asimov had a great big wide tableau and that kind I was of thing. Say that Leonardo not, da Vinci yeah, maybe not, and some of the people, you know what I'm saying? I do. Okay. It's not the the academics that I most look at. Right. You've actually just named a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and Arthur C. Clarke is another one. Yeah. People who <clears throat> had an ability to relate things to each other in a remarkable way. Uh -huh. uh, da Vinci is somebody that I studied for many years because I was developing a film uh, about Da Vinci. Uh -huh. and so I read everything I could. Did you realize the film? No, it's actually still it's still on paper. It's still in your head. And it's on paper right it's now. It's in design. Yeah. I. Uh, the person that I w hope to star in the film um, is now too old to star in the film. I see. Because it, st mm -hmm. it starts very young, and I was going to do a whole series of makeup things, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's still there. It's still yeah, waiting. I, yeah. have a, I have a number of projects like that that I, that I gave birth to uh -huh. and that I put away, not to you know die, but mm. put away until a better time. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, well, that's biding your time, that's mm -hmm. kind of thing. And mm -hmm. you have a wide interest in that. And when did you pick up on this idea? Because it's a phenomenon. We want to spell out some of the phenomena. It, it was called, what the bleep uh, do, we know? do we know, which became a national world phenomena. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share a little bit of that for some of the people who may have missed it, because it's mm -hmm. had a huge DVD sale, huge thing. Uh, 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 people all over the world are very interested in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe share that, and then we want to get to Mentioning, the, you know, getting specifically to the down the rabbit hole, the secret right. to it. But well, the idea came, um, it started about the year 2000. I was uh, finishing off a project, and Will Arnst, who was, who was one of the other directors and, and the producer and the financier of the project, mm -hmm. was looking over my shoulder one day uh, as I was editing, and he said, you know, 
I went to like film school for a while, years and years ago, uh -huh. and this looks like a lot of fun. Uh -huh. And Will is somebody who's really wanted to make an impact of some kind. He just didn't know how he was going to do that. And what was his background again? I'm sorry. Software. Software. Yeah. Okay. He was a laser physicist uh, okay. for a while, and then uh -huh. he developed a bunch of software. Okay. And he made his money doing software. That's a design thing that's of real importance in the mo mm -hmm. modern world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. So Will. Um, and I got together and right. started sharing with each other what, what is it we wanted to do in the world and what is it we wanted to see and what were we interested in. Right. And Will said, you know, I have a fascination with science and mysticism. And I said, well, mysticism. Me, mysticism. Okay. In other words, he'd been on his spiritual path for many, many years. Okay. And I'd been on mine for many years. Where was yours based? I mean, where were you? Were you Vedic or? I or um, his? started as a Christian. Okay. Uh, when I was about. Uh, I tried a lot of things. I was looking for something. <laughs> yeah, we do do that. You know, like really. I said to my mom, yeah. there's something I'm looking for. Like, so when I was who? eight, my mom. Your mother, yeah. Wh when I was eight, I said, you know, I'm looking for something. So she got me like books on kung fu and karate and all kinds of things. And that wasn't it. Martial when arts. I was about 12, um, I started s studying with my mother um, Hinduism, sort of doing yoga. Then, Hatha? Hatha yoga? Um, no, it was something else. And I can't remember the name right now. Uh -huh. And the reason I can't remember is because later on I rebelled. So I, I cut it all out of my head. Then I studied Buddhism for a while. Then I did sort of my stint in the New Age for a while. But none of the things really seemed to pull it together and satisfy me. Mm -hmm. Until I started to look at science and I wondered if there was a more rational way to look at all the, the, the anomalies that were occurring and there's yeah. a way to tie them together. Yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. And so maybe, when I found maybe, science, I was like, okay, I think mm -hmm. this is something that I want to really pursue. Mm -hmm. Did you, you never got into Fuller? You know, I didn't really. I, I would funny. suggest and I was you might want to take a look I at that. I think he's going to be resurrected. I mean, mm -hmm. he's the best mind of our time. And it, fall, it, it takes a comprehensive measure of things, the evolution of consciousness and so forth, but it deals with it from a context where he takes notice of the spiritual context of consciousness on a cosmic scale or something like that, but parks it and then gets on with the business of how are we going to organize this system involving humanity as part of the evolution of consciousness coming out without trying to... Uh, set up uh, the understanding that we have of the way the universe is structured in some spiritual sense. We'll deal with that when we get humanity liberated mm -hmm. and safeguarded against its own destruction. That sounds like Which a very intelligent a idea. Well, it does to me. He seems to be the best. He had that world game, and I'm partial. Fuller, McLuhan, mm -hmm. Tahar de Chardin you never picked up on? Yes. The Omega I actually point have, that, have a book Cosm right now. And, yeah. And the idea of, uh, you know, the, the, zo the, the noosphere that there's a hydrosphere. Yes, hydro yes. You know, so these are some things that are trying to pick up on these things. But, uh, you know, I think um, more important for me, and I'm, it's, it's, it's really great to hear that. Short of spirituality, because there's been all these people who have projected what the world is like in terms of some god or something like that, which is another context that maybe we'll be introduced into another la layer or another level of consciousness if we get ourselves together in terms of making this transit that we're going through now and don't destroy ourselves. If we liberate humanity within an ecological context, we'll be introduced into a level of consciousness. But people throughout the ages have tried to probe what that higher level is, and we won't know what that is until we get out of the womb of where we've been for 200,000 years as a species, and then we'll be introduced to that. If you can understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, okay, that's mm -hmm. all. So the thing I like about Fuller, what you're saying, is that you know, it seems that he takes a very practical approach to our survival he, and to day-to-day yeah. -day matters, and I think that in the end, the thing that I think sometimes disturbs me about um, some ways of trying to live a spiritual life mm -hmm. is that they sometimes deny the day-to-day -day workings of humanity. Yeah. The bottom line is no matter whether, whether the grand unified field theory is found out, whether yeah, somebody <laughs> you know, stares into the face of God and knows oh. it or not, uh -huh. the bottom line is you know, do we have, as a civilization have what it takes to, to, live, to live our civilization ethically and as you say, not destroy each other. And on a very, very simple level, do we have the ability to be happy? Just having the accumulation of knowledge does not necessarily create happiness. No, but it's a nice thing to have as part of the thing. Well, it's a nice thing to have, but if you're not happy, so what? Uh, right you are in that kind of sense. But I mean, I, mean, I can be the most intelligent person in the world and repeat things back like a parrot. Yeah. But if I'm not happy with uh -huh. myself, uh -huh. life's a little glummer. Uh -huh. Is that a word, glummer? I don't know. If it isn't, it should be. From the word glum. <laughs> glum. It's glummer. That, I, I, and the problem is when life's glummer, yeah. we tend to behave a little, little less humanly. Mm. 
we tend to objectify other human beings mm -hmm. because we now project out from ourselves, from our glum selves, uh -huh. that everybody else is kind of glum too. Well, you know, James Joyce had Daedalus say, history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken. Some people see it that way. We're coming out of 200,000 years of our existence, 10,000 generations, and most of that time we've been, a, most of that time we spent a time running away from leopards because we were very vulnerable. It was a very difficult kind of thing we're coming out of. And we had this whole evolutionary pattern that's evolved, and we may be coming to a time where there, we have a time now, existentially, we're at a time where we now have, we're so clever, an extension of our consciousness. We're the only creatures that can extend our consciousness through technology. Nobody else, they, birds make nests and that kind of thing. But on the whole, it's a given, like Eden, like metaphor or myth or something like that. But we can do it. Now we're so clever, we've gotten uh, technologically advanced systems of extension of our consciousness out in the environment that if those weapon systems that do exist as a reality, not an inflection point, a special theory of relativity or something, 1905, but as real systems that exist, at the behest of one person, if they happen to push the wrong button or happen to move wrong or something, they could destroy the whole species, apparently. That's what, what Mr. Cock would say. So my point. And so that's an existential inflection point or an mm -hmm. existential moment in the evolution of consciousness that we ought to take some note of, particularly what the averse side on a living side might be equally existentially significant to the, uh, to the affair but, of but human evolution but here's and the its thing. Uh, sociological, political, and economic here's organization. Here's the thing. All of that sounds very smart and very great. Mm. It's very intellectually, intellectually savvy. <laughs> But the one thing you said was, we can press a button and do away with all of it. Apparently. That appears to be the greatest problem. Mm -hmm. the, ga the, the garnering of intellect mm -hmm. hasn't seemed to help that much. Because well, there are still people that do not have an ethical understanding mm -hmm. of what it means to have that knowledge. So we develop enormous technology. We're at a point in our, in our world right now mm -hmm. where technology is here mm -hmm. and ethics are here. Ooh, okay, the technology is ahead. We have a design capability to take care of things in an ecological way. There's a great new book out called Massive Change, Bruce Mao, M-A-U, it's worth seeing, and everything. And it's, we have a design capability of making things work in a way ecologically. We have a, we have a capability that our historically inherited institutions are not allowing us to realize on a system scale for the whole of humanity, in a system scale, everybody, and it's inherent a contradiction or it's inherent schizophrenic situation. We're coming out of, we're waking from a, a historical context and our systems that we've inherited are out of date. The zeitgeist requires a new context of human organization, a new reality, a new understanding at a material level, and we don't have vision of that by our so-called leadership. And that's very difficult, a very difficult situation, it seems to me. So what do you think the solution is? I don't know. I mean, I think it might be your film might help because it's, you know, it's beginning to take the big picture, right? My you, point, again, yeah. is that all of that technology and all of that knowledge and all of those theories mm -hmm. are wonderful, mm -hmm. but unless people can start to actually get in touch with themselves mm -hmm. and with how they work and how we do things and why we feel the things we do and to feel all together. Mm -hmm. See, our society yeah. right now lives yeah. up here. Yeah. We live up here. You and I are sitting here talking up here. Yakety, 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 But the yakety, yakety, yakety yeah, yak yeah. doesn't really matter in the end. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because while the yakety, yakety, yak's happening, uh -huh. there's other people that are also yakety, yak that build massive weapons that can do amazing things mm -hmm. that don't actually have a sense of themselves mm -hmm. as emotional beings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and tend to, as I said, objectify other people. It's very easy for people to press a button and have that missile go and kill somebody. Been doing Beautiful it ever technology. since we've been here. So the point is, all oh. that knowledge, so what? Uh huh. Well, it might be that we're leading. Uh, Bucky Fuller used to look and he'd say, We have the second law of thermodynamics. I saw in one of your people thought you could run counter to the second law. I don't know about that, but all systems move toward chaos, to the limits of the system. Bucky used to cast about. I hate to keep coming back to him, but he's somebody who seems you to like be Bucky. very much. I mean, I think he's probably the best mind of our time or any other time in terms of putting it together comprehensively within a context and so forth. But he used to cast about, as he put it, and he said uh, that the whole biological process is an anti, he called it anti-entropic function in universe that moves across entropy and brings increased conscious pattern of understanding the process of which we are part. And we may be at a moment where we're going to be introduced to another level of consciousness relationship to the broader evolution of universal consciousness than we, uh, that we began 200,000 years ago. We, we're, we're going to have a liaison with consciousness at another level, collectively the whole of the human society liberated 
which it is not. We haven't got it together. If we make it, that's the big test before us. If we make it, we're going to be introduced to another level collectively, like the Bodhisattva idea, where they're going to have everybody. Li if any, there's too many things where I'm going to get through that gate, I'm going to get liberated or something, and we're going to liberate the whole system within an ecological context. And if we do, we're transcending our tenure on Earth, 200,000 years at this moment, and we need some direction on how to achieve that. So, what did you like about the film, by the way? Oh, I'm well, there was, from the beginning, I, I liked the introduction very much, mm -hmm. the thing where you set the context between the religion and the uh, and that that uh, that problem that there is between that. I would have liked to see a little bit more of a unified field theory in terms of physics rather than just quantum mechanics. It seemed to me it was stressed on quantum mechanics. And then also, I would have, for whatever it's worth, I would have liked to have seen something other than the uh, I would like to have seen some introducing or uh, relating to the political reality and the economic mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. because it seems to me it's the economics and the politics which is the major problem and the thing that's dragging us back rather than trying to go to some but level of individualized here's, here's realized the Here's the question liberation. though. When we, when we talk about, we say the political situation is dragging us back, et cetera. Holding us back. Holding us back. Perhaps who, who, drives, so. who drives the political situation? Well, it's a, it's a context of the people who have a control over the institutions that make up right. the historically inherited context right. that is Pe being superseded by the design capability. We have Pe a capability. Yeah. People. Yeah, okay. Human yeah, beings. People. Yeah, absolutely. Chemical human beings right. who have no understanding of how they work. Well, yeah. Who have a, we are, we are <laughs> smart monkeys. We have stimulus response mechanisms. Yeah. There's a stimulus, I respond. There's a stimulus, I respond. There's a stimulus, I respond. And I tend to respond the same way again and again. Mm, yeah. So to me, the most important thing mm -hmm. about the film is in the end, mm -hmm. whether or not we figure out, and I said this last night at the yeah. screening, you heard yeah. me say this, whether or not we find the grand unified field theory or not mm -hmm. may not necessarily change mm -hmm. the stimulus response habits that we have as human beings. Mm -hmm. I know. Could be. Any Most of us species know. Are, uh, have died. Most species died out. They have. And it may be in the terms of the evolution of universal consciousness, we may be meant to do ourselves in, just by holding on to old ideas rather than a new paradigm of liberation that's uh, multi involved with everybody, including those responsible for the historically inherited institutions that have to be transformed because the zeitgeist requires it. But we don't have it in our political or business leadership or the economic models that we have. But we don't have it because we have human beings uh, that it, don't, well, human beings are the ones that are constructing these systems, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with us as human beings is we tend not to address our stuff, mm -hmm. our emotional stuff. Yeah, okay, yeah. So now what happens is I'm a political leader, mm -hmm. right? Um, something happened when I was six years old, mm -hmm. and I'm still holding on to it. Yeah. And I react to other people that yeah. seem to press my button in that area. Yeah. So another world leader behaves, behaves like somebody that I remember when I was six years old, right. and suddenly I have a reaction. Yeah. Now I make a decision that's not rational, uh -huh. but emotional. Yeah, and we have that in the realm of memes now, not only gene, genetically individual, but memes, cultural memes that we hold on, outdated systems outdated system we hold on to because they got our identity by those things. And our identity is threatened by a liberating context of the whole, and they can't realize it. Maybe there's been some alteration in the uh, uh, comprehensive understanding equal to the fact that the, the capability to destroy ourselves is not a small matter. We couldn't do it in the Second World War. We were protected, like we're gestating within the womb. On the other side, Fuller's contention was within the material realm, we have transcended at a design level the iron clawed laws of scarcity, that there is not enough. We're now, all the, all the things are going exponential now in terms of the, we got carbon 60 coming now, we got a, we got a capability of providing for everyone, including in, within an ecological context that could be liberating, and we simply can't handle the fact that we're coming out of a situation where all our institutions are predicated on scarcity, We've transcended scarcity at a design capability level, and all our institutions are predicated within the context that we've been superseded by the zeitgeist, and we don't have a method of addressing that intellectually or, intellect or politically or in any kind of an economic philosophy. But what does that have to do with being happy? Well, I don't know. Being able to be happy, I don't know. Because happy people tend to make some good choices, and yeah. unhappy people tend to make some destructive choices. Yeah. Because okay. all the things you're yeah, saying, okay. all the things you're saying once again, and I love to you know to to nerd out and noggin out, mm. but I'm thinking that all the things you're saying 
all may be true and all are fascinating, yeah. but in the end, yeah. there are human beings living on this planet, mm -hmm. generating a tremendous amount of destruction, and intellectualizing what they're doing may not be as effective as actually getting in there mm -hmm. and having us learn about who we are, not as a systems thinker or a CEO or a president or any of those things, but just as a regular human being, as a right. biological machine right. that has some habits mm -hmm. and that we don't seem to have the ability to break those habits. Well, I think we're saying that not only at the individual level, but at the cultural level. We have memes, we have institutions, we have institutions that are outdated. The dynastic states of Europe had held for 800 years and they had a legitimate sense of their way of getting identity and along came a a change in the zeitgeist, and now there's a change coming in the zeitgeist, and it may be liberation is at hand. That we're going to have the whole of the human society being able to realize and liberate. We're like an orchestra. But Everybody how are playing, we going to be liberated? And that it's that synergistic resonance that will inter-accommodate us to the universe. But how? By getting the right design principles, or getting the design principles into a context where they can be realized in the material world that we are now superseding scarcity over which everybody has been fighting in a material level, short of some spiritual idea. So how would you say that to a person that doesn't have your intellectual capacity? You know, intellectual, it was Bucky Fuller, it's just a, a thing where... But try, try it on. I just did. But try it on, because like, that, that, there are people out there on, watching your show mm. that I'm certain are looking for, that understand that there's things that don't work mm -hmm. and are looking for and probably listen to you to try and understand is there another perspective mm. that um, might be helpful for me to understand myself and the world or us yeah well we've got dna a hundred thousand a hundred trillion cells in a human organism they all have a dna design that makes them work it's amazing and we now have knowledge we have a knowledge of things with neurotransmitters these things are all coming we may be realizing another relation, that we may be leave, leaving the womb, a large context. Collectively, everybody matters, everybody matters. We got too much where we do not see it as a whole interrelated system. Your film brought it out, it's all big one, old, we, and you can't have some cells operating well. Everything is operating within a context, the context and the context, the, 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 the gestating context, the medium, is one that has qualitatively changed but we haven't caught up with that yet. Maybe we're catching up with it now. So it would be coming from the world of design. So you've got all Hazel Henderson, all these people, they have capabilities that we have to make the planet work ecologically, in touch, Gaia, that kind of thing. But you have economic systems that are not able to do that. So I don't know, it's just a time. Do you feel it's a time of qualitative transformation in the evolution of events on this planet. That this what do you mean by qualitative transformation? A qualitative. Uh, like uh, there was Australopithecine, there was Homo habilis, and then there appeared Homo sapiens sapiens 200,000 years ago. We may be closing quotes on that, and we're going to come into it like Chardin said, the omega point, noosphere. We're there will be in time a certain point where we will be at a level of consciousness transcendent to what we've been throughout the human experience. You'll leave the womb, collectively. We'll leave the womb. And if we make it, it'll be a collective thing of the whole, and it'll be a resonancy like an orchestra where everybody's playing in a liberated way, which will inter-accommodate us to universe at a level transcendent to what we've been. It'll be a demonstration that we were successfully able to transit this birth that's occurring, but we have very little evidence of that. I mean, your film, it seems to me, is a, a tutorial that moves along the line of having people think holistically about these really big questions that challenge us all now in the evolution of affairs. I would like to have seen it relate some to economics and politics and how we can inform that world from another context, maybe one of understanding that eventually if people can understand there is enough. We can make it work for everybody. It's not zero sum. Robert Wright writes rules on that. It's not zero sum. We have another context that is a reality. It's, do you understand quite mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the context that I would think that we're in, it's mm -hmm. a very interesting time to be alive and participant, don't you think? I do. I think that, um, <clears throat> I hear what you're saying. In the end, I think that there is a little d dissatisfaction that people are experiencing now, mm -hmm. which is causing them to want to find bigger answers than we currently have. Because mm -hmm. the paradigm we currently have doesn't seem to be very effective. If it so. was don't effective... You like, don't you feel like we're in the womb and we're about to have some sort of a qualitative... It must be. It must have I felt think it that depends. way before we were born. I think it depends. We're it depends going out on what into people a new do. Context, yeah. It depends. Oh. To just sit back and say, 
you know, like, well, I hope that happens yeah. is, is one thing. It's a, uh -huh. quite another to actually take action and to, to cause it to occur. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes there's this perception people have that we're moving into a new era and that somehow we can all just sit in our bums and wait for it to happen. Mm. I'm thinking that we are the ones that need to be causing I it to occur. So. Man makes himself Gordon Child. Said, so as, an, yeah. as a great example, yeah. somebody who I admire, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., yeah, somebody great. I admire, yeah. I really feel participated in creating some level of change. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that yeah. there, is a, there is great cause for consternation in our leadership right now mm -hmm. throughout the world. Because right. leaders tend to, of all kinds, tend to help move things forward and Right. Um, there are some problems, so I'm 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 hoping that humanity doesn't just wait for it to happen, but does take some kind of action for these things to occur. I hope so. I got grandchildren now, and I don't want the whole bloody thing blown up by some irrational kind of thing like we've seemed to have been doing with alarming regularity since our tenure on Earth. You know what I'm saying? There's mm -hmm. something new, and your film seems to me to be a harbinger or a thing that helps move things along that way. You know, toward a a system that fulfilling maybe our purpose in universe is to try and get it together so that we can realize this transition that would be sort of at the in a certain sense you know a, a major one but we don't seem to see it you know we don't see where's Voltaire where are the visionaries that are able to start uh, I'm afraid probing they're in the grave but their words have been left behind uh-huh but your film is along that line don't you think because your people well, were you, you know the uh, Quantum mechanics is something really important and understanding things from that perspective. I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. I think because what happens is it helps, you know, just, just philosophically, yeah. as uh, Dean Radin said, it helps yeah. uh, undo some of the assumptions we have about the world. Yeah. We get very, very limited and locked into a certain perspective. Mm -hmm. And when we start to look at reality in a very different way and ourselves mm -hmm. in a different way, we start mm -hmm. to undo some of the assumptions we have about ourselves. Yeah. When we get broader, we begin to see things that we've never seen before. Right. And this is the problem. And there, can, there can be good news in that broader context. Always. Yeah. Right. That's a thing. When we're very emotional right. beings, we yeah. tend to be very, very reactive. narrow and yeah. reactive in right. our perspective. Right. That's why I think it's so crucial uh -huh. that we start addressing the emotion, con emotional condition of humanity. Yeah. Because until we do, people are making decisions very emotionally. Yeah. And, and emotions yeah. are not bad. Yeah, right. It's just it's there. what I mean yeah, is right. reactively. Yeah, yeah reactively. Just very reactive. Engrams, I think Mr. Hubbard used to talk about mm -hmm. that kind of thing. You got that kind of thing, yeah. But and then also that, that you know, this I, I don't think I don't think it's a small matter. Fuller with his world game. I keep coming back to that. I don't know, there must be others. Murray Bookshin. Buy some books were, as soon as I get out of here. Yeah, I, I would not not you, but everyone. I think th there's gonna be a revel there's gonna be a renovation uh, there's gonna be a recapturing of him, you know. BFI, BFI, he's the best mind of our time, or of any time. But it's a question of the design. We have a capability of understanding things and everything. But he had a thing called world game. They put all the resources and trends of human society and so forth, non-ideologically larded or non-spiritually, except spiritually we're part of a larger context that is a priori mystery. Let's deal with that once we get this system in order and we can move out of where we are now if we realize the transition. But, I mean, that's something that it seems to me eminent. But it's a question of education and filmmaking. Uh, we've extended all of our consciousness disproportionately, like Fuller said. And so, I mean, but, McClure, we're, filmmaking is really a way to reach people in an educational thing. Your vehicle, you know, d down the rabbit hole and also what the bleep are, is a major educational vehicle for what might be called now the Internet is coming. Major development, positive. There's a lot of positive things for an educational context. Is a major thing, and you might be able to think of the internet as like a uh, autodidactic university or something, where you can go and get things. And I'm really happy that you had such success with that because it was a vehicle for beginning to get people to start thinking about these larger issues and questions, which is the crucial thing. The anti-entropic function that mankind serves in the universe, it also, perhaps. It also indicates, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the sales of the film and the amount of people that have yeah. seen it, indicates that there are people that are very curious. We, we have this really interesting um, statistics. We have the highest number of multiple DVD sales yeah. um, in history. In fact, mm -hmm. we exceeded The Passion of Christ. Amazing. The Passion yeah. of Christ had 3% of all purchases were, were multiple sales. Yeah. And for our DVD, 6% were multiple sales. Wow, okay. It's extraordinary. Yeah, that's what good. What it means, basically, See, is people a buy there, copies right? and give it to people. Right, right. right. There's a hunger out there for mm -hmm. understanding, don't you think? There is. And you're helping to fill that and so forth. 
And now this new, the rabbit hole one, you just got down the rabbit hole, is a further step along that line. Mm -hmm. I congratulate you enormously and wish you all Thank the you. best. You're distributing it now. It's coming out now in February. It's February the 3rd, it opens in theaters. And for people that uh -huh. want to see where it opens right. around the country, uh -huh. Um, on our website, whatthebleep.com, yeah. they can look at uh, show dates and cities to see where it's going to be opening. Uh huh. That's really good. So I, I, that's uh, that's a very good thing. More things should be done along these lines in terms of multimedia, don't you think? I multimedia. do. I saw a thing the other day, if I may, I saw a thing on Christmas Day, one of the happiest days of my life. They had a thing where they've animated the creatures that were on the Earth 45 million years ago. Uh, Discovery? It was on Discovery mm -hmm. all day long. I was in ecstasy, and they and they had the things the best paleontologists, best minds, and they animated and they had environments that these creatures were the way it really looked. For it was just amazingly educational, mm. and it was good research. It was well researched, you know. And I was just thinking, if you translate that, Google's working on getting translation. You did that from English to Swahili. Mm -hmm. Six-year-old kids could be watching and getting educated like crazy about a real thing without ever reading a word. But they could, do you understand? It's exciting. So it is an exciting educational capability, particularly when you can just put other language to it and, and, and get these things in a multimedia mm -hmm. context. The next, frontier, the next frontier is video games. Because it's going great guns now. It, um, that's where there's more money being made in video games right now than in movies. I understand. So there's a lot of p kid, not just kids, yeah. but adults that are plugged into games. So mm -hmm. that's the next frontier of being able to get ideas out there. Because currently in video yeah. games, we have very, very um, damaging ideas. It's all war making. Yeah, and it's also as bad some as of them political leadership. It is. Well, no, some of the, the games bad. are actually yeah. uh, funded and developed by the by the military. Yeah. For I believe maybe the express purpose of finding you know good soldiers. Good new. Uh, and also being guns, able to yeah. get people to be de desensitized to the idea of killing somebody and to not, not to objectify other people oh, to the yeah. point that it doesn't seem to matter. Yeah, that's part. So that's of the it. frontier. So. Yeah. Uh, in my next film, we're developing a video game in conjunction with the film mm -hmm. that will be very, very entertaining and mm -hmm. very exciting, but help address some of these issues. And perhaps some people will find that they'll be more drawn to that than uh -huh. some of the more damaging games. Yeah, that's really good. They, they, they could do that. You know, one of the things that really encourages me is the youth. Let me just share it with you because I'm older, right? And the thing is that they, we, we came along and you didn't have much, the, the technology that came, that's what's changing. I don't know that we've changed that much biologically. And so, but the technology, and the first thing that came along that was programmable was the VCR. And there was a generation where 12, over 60% of the VCRs sold into the world market or American market were flashing 12 because the generations couldn't understand how to program the mm -hmm. damn thing. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a youthful generation, you know, the young people come along and they have learned like they learned a language at their mother's breast, I mean, just by osmosis, how to make the computers work. And they're eminently more computer. You get a 10-year-old, he comes in, he plays the computer the keyboard like Vladimir Horowitz plays the piano. He knows the Zorch connects to the Zorch. That's an incredibly encouraging thing that they've learned that like you would learn English or mm -hmm. you learn a language of use by osmosis. Don't you think that mm -hmm. the technology? They're very savvy now. Yeah, they're very savvy, and that's good. That's I mean, I grew up in that some of that generation. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I I was a computer whiz when I was a kid, and it's, you were. it's true. My my parents always asked me to like you know fix everything because mm -hmm. my mind was attuned to that way of thinking. Right, right. And now what kids can do now is staggering. Yeah. Their you ability to take information in is amazing. That's that's very encouraging, don't you think? That they can do that, and then but the question is what kind of information? Oh, right. Okay. You know, because what's happening yeah. is. If we can take the media, that uh -huh. pipeline, and uh -huh. start getting people to understand um, what it is to be human as opposed to distance oneself from being or human. maybe a vision of what it is to be where we're going and get into a context where it isn't all... Same thing. It isn't all reactive, uh, negative things coming out of a historical context of negative feedback and that there's a positive scenario to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, just know, to be yeah. human, to understand what it is to be human. To be human or to be even an opening upon something that's beyond To be human. human. Let's start with human. Okay. The way Buckminster Fuller says, you yeah. know, the, all those things out there are great and God yeah. and the cosmos are yeah, wonderful, yeah, yeah, yeah. but let's see if we can restructure things here. Yeah. Let's just start with being human. Yeah. For Before, everybody. For everybody. For everybody. Before not we just start, like, having groups. great theories about yeah. potentials, yeah. the potentials are there. Yeah. They don't, they're not going to go away. Uh-huh. But let's work on being humans because we, after all, are the beneficiaries of what we developed or we won't make it.
You know, one of the two. We either we'll make it or we're not going to make it. One of his books was Utopia or Oblivion. Now, Utopia is a negative thing, but it really is. We're living in a time like no other, and this is a time of qualitative uh, challenge. And the Chinese said, spare us from living in interesting times. That's shot to hell because these are the we're most interesting, interesting times, yeah. times ever, ever, and the challenge is there. It seems to me your work and your life and what you're doing is really helping to fill the gap in terms of educationally helping us and uh, many people understand, in a multimedia context, larger realities. I congratulate you and your colleagues enormously on that. Thank and you. wish you all the very best with Thank the picture. You. Appreciate it. I know you've got a plane, no, a train. A train to catch, catch. I it's do. It's amazing we have to do that. So what we're going to do is have to sign off now. Okay? Gotcha. Let's be in touch. And you'll play some things. And then we've got some trailer footage for about the film and everything, but just a great pleasure talking to you. I don't Thank want you. you to miss that train. I was. Because you have important important appointments I do. to I keep, do. don't you? I do. Good, I'm glad that. It's been your pleasure, the perceptions of uh, Mark, uh, Mark, uh, help me out? Vicente. Vicente, co-producer, director of this film. Uh, the newest one is Down the Rabbit Hole, and it was preceded by uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? Major educational experience. One has encouraged one and all to see it. Maybe we could run the credit quickly then, and we're going to show uh, some clips, some trailers and so forth from this so that you, Mark, can catch a train. On to your next important assignment. And when you're back in New York, do try to be in touch. Let's be well in done. touch. Will do. Your pleasure to have his perception. We invite you to tune in. We'll come back again tomorrow. That's it for now. Stay tuned. We're going to show some trailer footage from the uh, DVD about this amazing film that's now coming out in February 2006. So one more time, Mark, thank you very, very much for all the work. And uh, let us try to stay in touch. And I would encourage you to think of uh, maybe getting in touch with Mr. Fuller. You and your colleagues, perhaps. You know, I, I think he's going to be resurrected, as it were. But sounds good. That's my thing. Sounds good. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. We'll be coming right back. I've got a thing. They don't know quite what all the buzz is about, but they know there's a big buzz, a big underground buzz for this very offbeat film. After seeing the film, I can understand why that would be. It's a whole theory that lays out why that cartoon is scientifically accurate. <laughs> in the supermarket, you know, people say, you were in that movie. And after 40 years of being in the business, I'm discovered. You never answer my question. What question? How far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? All the way. We are all one. It's very difficult to wrap your mind around that. The first people who did these experiments, those people were flabbergasted. What? It's tricky. I don't know if you want to go there. You do want to go there? So. You should try it. I want to see the zero point field. Understanding? It's going to run all by itself now. You've asked the questions in the first movie. Now we're just on the verge of being able to answer those questions. The conclusion is inescapable. weirdness the infamous double slit experiment to understand this experiment we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act if we randomly shoot a small object say a marble at the screen we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit now if we add a second slit we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, 
Let's look at waves. The waves hit the slip and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slip. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slip, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it